Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan, and today we're talking about the case against quantitative data. My guest is Jim Callback. Yes, that really is his number. It's perfect for this show. Jim Callback is the author of the Jobs to Be Done Playbook. Today we are talking about all things data and why it's problematic that companies and businesses are so obsessed with quantitative data and technology that they often forget about the problem the customer is trying to solve. Jim is a noted author, speaker, and instructor in innovation design and the future of work. He's currently chief evangelist at Mural, the leading online whiteboard company. Jim is the author of several books, including Designing Web Navigation back in 2007, Mapping Experiences, the second edition in 2020, and of course, Jobs to be Done, which we're talking about now. This episode might completely shift your mindset around what data and customer feedback you should be paying attention to. Please enjoy Jim Callback. Jim, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm so excited to be here with you today and to see all these customer experience books behind your head. It just, I get really excited when I see that. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. So you have a long history of being interested in customer experience, of experience design. You've written a lot of content about this topic. How did you get started, get interested in customer experience? Yeah. Great question. I actually uh, came up from the design side of things. And by that, I mean, you know, product design. We called it UX back in the days. Um, But uh, as I worked for different companies in different situations, I realized there was a, you know, more strategic aspect there around coordinating um, customer outcomes with business outcomes, right? Uh, you know, starting from the outside in, thinking from the outside in, and those types of things. So I, I, I kind of moved into, um, you know, my, my one of my first big milestones was mapping experiences, and I have a book called Mapping Experiences. Of course, customer journey maps and experience maps are things that we're all familiar with with these days, and uh, that was uh, an approach that I latched onto earlier to start having those more strategic conversations about experience in general, whether it was UX or CX, or now we talk about EX and brand X. And, you know, I I was just thinking about it a little bit more holistically, particularly through the lens of mapping experiences. Yeah. I mean, you wrote your book, Designing Web Navigation with, I think, Tim O'Reilly in 2007 or O'Reilly Media. How did that work? Yeah, that, that really reflects my, my design background. So I, um, like I said, I was kind of hardcore, you know, information architect and 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 web designer uh, back then. Uh, but even that book itself, so designing web navigation, you know, a large website is is a fairly sorting that out is a fairly complex challenge. And the view there was a human centered view, right? So if I could understand the people who I was designing for, right, you can design a better navigation. And I think that that kind of philosophy, if you then look at the more strategic aspects that I was talking about, like with mapping the customer experience and journey maps, and then more recently, you know, I'm looking at jobs to be done, which is a specific framework. We can talk about that in a minute. I think what all of those have to com- in common, since you mentioned designing web navigation, I think is really starting with the human problem, starting with the individual and working back towards the technology, not the other way around, right? Uh, And that's what, when we talk about customer centricity, uh, for me, it's not about how nice your support agents answer the phone or, Mm -hmm. you know, how how well your sales team treats your customers. It's really about a a mindset shift, a perspective that you as an organization, you believe Mm -hmm. growth comes from understanding the humans that you serve and working back towards how you can best serve them. Yeah. I mean, this is really the essence of, it it feels to me like most modern customer experience strategies are just baked in empathy. It's like, hey, why don't we start with what's happening with the customer? Let's switch and talk about jobs to be done because I am really curious about this book. Um, Why do you think that this book, why do you think people needed this book and what are the major tenets of the book? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. I actually got exposed to Jobs to be Done in uh, 
2003, so tw 20 years ago, I realized that 20 years ago now. And that was when I was working as a designer. And the language that the community at the time, the Jobs to be Done community was using really, really resonated with me. And it's essentially that message that, that I just said, which was um, you know, start with the human problem and work back towards the technology. As a designer, that philosophy and specifically the Jobs to be Done framework helped me think through a lot of problems that I was trying to express uh, to others and convince others of. And then, you know, through mapping experiences and the customer Customer success, uh, customer experience work that I did, um, it, jobs to be done had helped me as well too. So I had, I had been dabbling with and practicing and trying to uh, put jobs to be done into practice for over 15 years before I started teaching a course on it, um, and that really helped me uh, get the verbiage down for how do you explain jobs to be done. So I wrote the book really as a sum of all of my experience using jobs to be done. Uh, and in particular, the mistakes that I made, because it's a really powerful framework, I believe, to help understand customer needs. Um, but it was it's a confusing field. And what I tried to do in the book is I tried to kind of sort it out and clarify it and just bring it down to earth. Because I myself, you know, as I was trying to understand it and, and put it into practice, um, I, I, I kind of it kind of got away from me. So so my intent was to help other folks understand another human centric technique that they might be able to use. All right. So if you had to boil down the framework mm -hmm. in like, yeah three sentences, what would those three sentences be? Sure. Um, jobs to be done is a, is, a, is a framework to understand the needs of the people you're trying to serve, serve independent of technology. Mm. I'm just going to say that again. Yeah. Understand problems independent of technology. That means your own product, brand, or solution, you have to put that to the side for a moment. We don't care about segmentation or your brand or your price point or your product. That comes in later. What we want to do is we want to analyze the problem and understand the problem. Okay. I love that. So I always say, you know, if you're interested in the problem, you'll never be short of a customer because many businesses don't want to deal with the problems. What are the yeah. best ways to get to the root of those problems and see them really yeah. clearly? Right. Yeah. Um, so the job speed on framework, as, as the name kind of implies, it focuses on the job to be done. So we don't go out and think about demographics or, or even segments. It, it, this, is, this is hard for marketers and customer experience people to get started with because we're not looking at your segments. We're not looking at your market or your brand p position in the market. We're putting that aside. And what we're saying is we want to find the job that we want to serve for. And we make the job the unit of analysis, not your problem of distribution or your problem of marketing. It's who do we want to serve and what are they trying to get done? Then what, once you define that, so the job, the job to be done is a functional job, right? Which could be anything from... Um, you know, I was just working with, with uh, treating the flu or preparing a meal or commuting to work or submitting an expense, uh, an, 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 uh, a business expense. Uh, there's higher jobs or smaller jobs or bigger jobs, uh, I, I should say. But that job then frames your field of inquiry. Rather than being concerned about a set of demographics, you then look at how do people get that job done? How do they feel while they're getting that job done? Uh, what are the outcomes that they want? That's a really important aspect there is what, is their, what are their measures of success? And from that, what you can do, what the framework does, is it gives you a language and a system to be able to pinpoint unmet needs in your market, independent of your own uh, technology, product, or solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I mean, this must just be like crazy making for businesses that just are not used to this type of approach. Because, I mean, organizational structure, I mean, Jim, isn't organizational structure like challenged when you start to, to like think backwards like you're saying yeah uh yes yes it, it, organizational structure is challenged marketing distribution gets challenged as well too here's the thing that all comes back into play i'm not saying don't do a customer journey map i'm not saying don't do segmentation what i'm saying is put that aside for a moment and it's a mindset shift it's a temporary mindset shift to say pretend we didn't exist and none of that existed there's human beings in the market that we want to serve. What are they trying to get done, right? So Jobs to be done actually suggests a sequence, 
which is to start with the problem, not your problem, not your product's problem, not your price point problem, what is their problem, and then work back towards the solution. So all that other stuff comes in, into play, your go-to-market motion, your product, technology, or uh, service, whatever that is, that comes back into play when you then have to come up with the innovation or the offering that you have, right? So job speed is a temporary mind shift. I think about it like an out-of-body experience. If you're an organization and you manufacture a product, you're, you're, that's all you're thinking about all day long. And all we're saying is just stop, stop thinking about that. Let's float above yourself, look back as if you're just a human being in the world trying to get something done. What is that thing you're trying to get done? And then all those things that you said come in later when you actually do have to go to market and you actually do have to build something. It comes back in later. But here's the thing. That temporary mindset shift allows you to see opportunities that maybe you're otherwise that might otherwise be overlooked because you're kind of blinded by your own technology and your own brand and your own language and things like that. And it puts all that aside temporarily. It comes back in, but you just put it aside temporarily. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to hear for our audience and our viewers like an example of maybe on a large scale where the company and the executives were so obsessed with me, 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 me. And there was a yeah. shift to customer, yeah. customer, customer, customer. Right. I, I mean, the, the, the example that I start off with in my book, and it, it's a really good example um, b because it's also had, you know, media play and Harvard Business Review and things like that is uh, Intuit. Mm -hmm. So Intuit, the, ta the tax uh, software company. And, you know, Scott Cook there and is it, um, what's his name? Smith, Brad Smith. Um, had both had contact with Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen, uh, of course, passed away, but he was um, a, a Harvard Business School professor and um, the kind of the, the originator of the jobs to be done techniques and, and line of thought. So, so they, had, they had collaborated with him and, you know, he impressed upon them kind of the point that I just made right now is, OK, great. You got marketing segment and you got your brand and your price points and all everything else that, you know, you're trying to deal with software and technology. What are people trying to get done? Right. And he helped them shift, shift their mind. So they they have they have examples uh, from from Intuit where the at a strategic level, you know, the company um, uh, had to kind of evaluate and think about um, uh, what what its targets were uh, at a strategic level. And I think not necessarily because of that, but co 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 coinciding with some of this, this shift in mind, mindset. Um, they also developed, you know, their Design for Delight program, mm -hmm. and Intuit has a very, very rich and deep uh, customer empathy um, set of uh, motions and techniques in, in place, like follow me home. So everybody at Intuit is expected to, to observe customers and go talk to customers and things like that. So it had deep, uh, deep you know, th this line of thinking had deep effects in, in, into that company. Yeah, I mean, Intuit, apparently, I was reading in Fred Reichold's new book, Winning on Purpose, he was, he went, or the founder, what's his name again, of Intuit? Uh, Blanking on uh, is, it, is it Brad Smith or Tim Cook? I forget, not Tim Cook, Scott Cook, Scott Cook, yeah. So I think Scott Cook yeah. and Fred yeah. Reichold worked together, or no, Might yeah, worked been, at yeah. Bain together. And so Intuit said, oh, we want to pioneer your net promoter. We want to see how that will go. And so that was like the beginning. Yeah. And it wasn't that long ago that this all happened because, I mean, I still network with people that got their start during that time at Intuit. And so many companies are just still even trying to catch up with just the table stakes, the basics of customer yeah. experience. Are there any, any major missteps that you've seen where maybe the whole industry has adopted something? Let's say, for example, an NPS, and then yeah. it just turns out that, okay, we're just gaming the system to get the scores that we want or like good intentions but in the yeah. execution, something falls flat. Um, I think NPS is a good example. Um, um, NPS gets a, uh, a lot of bad press and, you know, uh, everything from, you know, the science of it has been disproven completely to, uh, you know, organizations, you know, misusing uh, the score and the number or, you know, managing to the number. I think there is an obsession with the number. Uh, I'm personally, I'm, uh, I'm not against MPS. Uh, I think it has a place to have that benchmark around you know, customer viewpoint is, is really important. 
For me, I'm, I'm more uh, fascinated by the verbatims, actually, because MPS is two questions, right? We always forget that, that MPS is two questions. It's scale of zero to 10, but why did you give that answer? And I think there's a lot of information in that second part of that as well, too. The first part is just kind of a barometer, you know, how, how, how well are we doing? But it's a lagging indicator, right? So, you know, don't, don't try to make that a leading indicator, but also don't forget your verbatims. Uh, and there's a lot you can do with those um, uh, in terms of analysis, but also outreach and all kinds of other things as, as well, too. Um, I, I think um, I think another, you know, when I when I think about I'm just going uh, to a different topic now, uh, kind of kind of around mapping experiences and uh, thinking about the customer. You know, we talk about the customer journey and you just mentioned the word empathy. Um, I think one thing that I see um, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a mistake. I think it's a gap. I think it's a gap, and that is relying too much on quantitative data only. Mm -hmm. uh, quantitative data is great, but in order to interpret that, you have to have a valid view, a real world view of what customers are all about, and um, going out and talking to customers. I mean, we don't like to do that because oh, it's too small of a sample size, or that's anecdotal. But that's how you get to be able to interpret your quantitative data is by having that level of understanding. And I think we overlook or discount qualitative um, touch points and, and qualitative data points with, uh, with customers far, 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 far too much. Uh, you know, I was just working with a team right now and they're like, oh, we, we don't know what problem we're solving. I'm just kind of simplifying what the, mm -hmm. what the conversation was about. And they said, oh, let's hire an agency to do a survey. Yeah. I'm like, no, the answer should have been let's let's each of us go out and talk to five customers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think we overlook that um, too, too quickly. Uh, and then and then and then we 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 put a lot of faith into reliable data. And there's a difference. Here's the here's the bottom line, Blake. There's a difference between reliable data and valid data. Mm -hmm. And I think we conflate those. Reliable is you can repeat it, right? That I can get the same results every time I do MPS. I know my data, the stream, how it's going to be measured and that kind of thing. Valid data is does that, does that actually reflect the real world, mm -hmm. right? And that's where I think qualitative data can give you a richer, um, more complete view of, of your reliable data if you understand the real world that's out there. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so smart. And yeah, why? That's a great question. Why don't more executives go out to the front lines if they can't get a hold of customers? Talk to your frontline employees or contact center agents. Yeah. One of the things I thought about is everybody listening and watching, look at your calendar on your schedule. Is the word customer in your weekly calendar at all? Yeah. Have you talked to right. any customer? When was the last time you talked to a customer? <laughs> Why? I mean, I don't want to say it's laziness because I'm going to assume everyone is hardworking and they're doing the best job they can. Yeah. Why have we gotten so far from common sense? Talk to your customers. I, I, I believe it is an over-reliance and almost in some cases I've seen an addiction or obsession to quantitative data. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, you know, if I need to know what's going on, let's look at the metrics, right? Yeah. And then you pull up some dashboard and, and a lot of times I see things coming up and I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't reflect the real world, right? And I say that because I used to, at my current company, uh, I've moved into a different role now, but I used to head up our customer success team and my calendar was 50% customer calls, wow. right? And I would visit them on site before the pandemic and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I was not only feeling their pain, not, not their pain of, of, around our solution, but just in general, I was not only feeling that, I was trying to solve their problems with them, right? Mm -hmm. Over five years, I probably had thousands and thousands of customer interactions. And then I see a dashboard pop up and I'm like, that, that's reliable because you can get that view at, over and over again with your data, but it doesn't match the real world that I've seen out there at, at all. And I think, I think we've gotten overconfident with, with only one type of data, which I'll call quantitative slash reliable data. And um, uh, I, I you know, go back to the point uh, that I made, but also to answer your question, I, I, I just think it's... Um, yeah, maybe it's laziness or, uh, uh, you know, that I, I know I or maybe it's a complacency. It's more of a complacency It's like I know the answer. I have I have my my metrics and my dashboard over here. But let's go out and get five real world customer stories yeah. to complement that. It complements it. Right. It, it doesn't replace it. It complements it. 
Wow. You are just really blowing the minds of our listeners and viewers right now. Okay, and great. I, I literally just took a note that I feel like I have to call this podcast the case against quantitative data. That's like <laughs> literally the platform you're standing on. Um, and it's interesting. So you think we're almost addicted to this data software, but it's just not even accurate. And it's almost like maybe these businesses have gotten too big because in the old days, yeah. you know, you run a little small company, you know, all 30 of your customers because they come into your store. Yeah, right. I uh, uh, agree. And then, okay, so at scale, so Jim, how, do I, you know, I have thousands and thousands of customers. How am I going to go talk to all of them? Right. Fair point. Okay. So that, and that's what I'm saying. I think you do need quali quantitative data. Um, and it may not even be inaccurate. It just, it just doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture and it doesn't necessarily tell the real world picture, right? Uh, I guess my point is in order to interpret that, I believe you, you have to have that real world view as well too, which is rich and contextual and emotional and human and all of those other things. There's, a, there's another distinction that folks have been, that, that have made between what's called thin data and thick data. Mm -hmm. um, I, I forget her name. She, she has a, I believe she has a TED talk or a TEDx talk. But if you, if you uh, Google thick data, I think you'll, you'll, find, you'll find her name. Maybe it'll come to me as I'm speaking here. So thin data, is, it could be accurate. It could be big data. It, there could be lots and lots of data points. But it basically just says one thing, like how many people downloaded this product or how many people converted, right? It's, it's very thin. Thick data is how do people feel before, during, and after that? What types, of, uh, what, what types of needs and outcomes were they seeking? What was the social context of that conversion, right? So your sample size is going to go down, right, uh, which is okay, but you're going to get way more context so that you're going to get thick a thick description of, of human experience versus a thin description of the human experience. Again, I think you need both. I, I, I really believe you, you, need do, you, you need both. So it's not against quantitative data. I just feel that quantitative data alone only tells, in my opinion, it only tells 50% of the story. It's only, you're, only, you're, you're, only half, you're only half full if you have quantitative data only. So Jim, one of the things that least practitioners that I talk to struggle with is when you do gather all that feedback and you pull out, oh my gosh, look at this email that this customer sent us. I want to send yes. this to my CEO. Like I want to send all types of content to show what our customers are actually going through. Have you seen a great way to serve that up the chain so it's compelling? Yes. I have indeed. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, Mapping Experiences, because I believe what an experience map can do, and there's various flavors of them, right? Customer journey map, experience map, there's service blueprints, there's all kinds of different ways you can do it. It's basically storytelling, mm -hmm. right? It's basically saying, I went out and I looked at quantitative data, but I also talked to people and I got this qualitative data. And I want to put that together in a compelling narrative that a C-level person can approach. And guess what? A map usually fits on one page or one slide, right? So you can very often tell a lot of those compelling stories that you want to tell through something like a visualization or a map. And so just to be even more specific, some of the elements that I very often bring into my mapping are things like customer quotes, mm -hmm. right? So very often it's chronological and you have stages and you might have pain points and things like that. Put some customer quotes in there. And this is what somebody actually said to me that, that, that validates and, and enhances and deepens or thickens the, the story at that point in time. Uh, videos, video testimonials, another great way to do that as mm -hmm. well too, right? Um, there, there are then other, you know, other, other types of artifacts and deliverables and sessions and things that you can run. Um, uh, Role-playing. I've done role playing, which is great, where you get people and say, "Okay, let's let's get put you in that situation and you act like them and see what happens." Um, uh, are a great way, but you know, one of the best ways the best ways to get people exposed to that is what? go out and talk to people. Yeah, do, do, let's like seriously, uh, you, you know, bring an exec along next time you do a customer interview. Bring an exec along. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you find again and again, like the best CEOs, they'll just go into a store as a mystery shopper, or they'll fly yep. their own airline or whatever it is. And I just can't even imagine not wanting to do that as a leader and being yeah. obsessed with the honest truth of what's happening yeah. with customers every day. 
Agree. Yeah, there is this show. It's called Undercover Boss. I, I think is a TV show. show. Yeah. Do you ever see that show? Right. Oh, so many it's the times. same story. It's the same story every time. It's the same story. Yeah. The boss goes undercover and discovers strategic insight about how the business is being run by being on the front lines and yeah. talking to customers. Every time, it's the same outcome. And they go, "I didn't realize that was going on." Right. That's a very good show. And my husband and I used to watch it. And I yeah. feel like so many times everyone is in tears. Because there's some <laughs> moment of like, I didn't even realize how much we're impacting customers until I met them. And it's just yeah. such a good show. I love that show so much. That, that I call that thick data. Going out and having that experience yourself and having internalizing that, mm -hmm. you, you can get a different internalization of the, of the ex customer experience. So we talk about customer experience and I can map it. I can have data behind it. But you really internalize the customer experience when you're out there watching it or talking about it or experiencing it yourself. Uh, you know, mystery shopping is, is a great thing as well, too. But that it's that internalization that you get from thick data that is so, so, so important. And, you know, back to your other question, what's missing? I think it's that firsthand empathetic internalization of the experience that's missing. I think that is so powerful. And if there's one tip you could give everybody listening and watching as we reach the end of the formal part of the interview and get into our rapid fire, what's one tip that they should be doing like today? Get out of the building. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fi figuratively now, you know, post pandemic, it could be on Zoom, but get get it get out and 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 talk and talk to people. And here's the thing, th this is where the jobs to be done mindset comes back in. Put you put your product aside because if you're talking to people about their you know bug your usability complaints of your software, if you're talking to people about their price point, that's what you're going to hear back. Talk to them about what they're trying to get done and what their problems are, and mm -hmm. really try to get as deep beyond yourself as you can into what what they're trying to do. In, in the domain of interest, you know, if you're in insurance, you don't talk to people about going to classical music concerts. You want to talk to them about insurance, right? So there's that frame, but put your solution aside and get as deep as you can into their world. And that's such a great example for an industry because insurance is guilty of not talking to customers even more than once a year, if once a year. So you have no idea if your customers' lives have changed and your product, they need more or less of your product. Let's talk about you. Let's get to know you a little bit. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? I am ready. Okay, well, let's get to the fun part so everybody can get to know you a little bit better outside of our conversation around data. Question number one, what does your morning routine look like, Jim? Morning routine, um, get up around seven-ish or so. I work from home, so I actually don't need to set an alarm clock because the cat or somebody will wake me up naturally. And then I go down and have breakfast with my wife. And then I come back up here and I'm glued to my chair for the most of the day. Yeah, nice. Actually, I don't even know where you live. Where do you live? What city? I am in Jersey City, New Jersey, right outside of Manhattan oh, on the East Coast. Nice. I've been there for sure. Okay, question number two. What do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Yeah, great question. Uh, very often I go out on a bike ride. Uh, now that the weather's getting... Uh, better are uh, some really great places to to ride your bike, particularly Liberty State Park, which is right it's closest to the Statue of Liberty as you can get on and still be on land. So I, I go out there three, four, or five days a week. I'll uh, probably do that today. Actually, that sounds awesome. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Ooh, leadership book or resource. Ooh, that's a tough one. I don't know if I have a favorite. Hmm. It could be a person, um, like somebody that inspires you. Yeah, I was going to say Roger Martin, actually. Um, so R Roger Martin is a professor at the Rotman School uh, in uh, Toronto, a school of business at Toronto. He's, li he's written a lot on strategy, mm -hmm. which has influenced me. He's also written about, about design thinking. And some of the points that I made today about reliability and validity, I actually got from him. He's got a new book out. Um, Rethink, I forget the name of it, but he's got a chapter on uh, obsession with quantitative data. Mm -hmm. So some of my inspiration for my answer to the question there actually came right from Roger Martin. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? Breathe. Perfect. Breathe like, like mind, mindful breathing. Perfect. What is your favorite type of vacation? 
Um, I think just a, a, a driving vacation. We, Catskills is two hours from, from us. Like I, I don't need to get on a plane and sit on a beach with a, an umbrella and my cocktail. Just go up to the mountains and do nothing. Awesome. <laughs> if you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, man. A dead or alive? Mm. I, I'm going to... I don't know why. I just said Igor Stravinsky, a uh, famous composer. Mm-hmm. If you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would that be? Oh, my outlook. Um, cautiously, cautiously hopeful. Uh, and there's a lot of change in things in the world right now. I have personal change and things going on. So uh, I, I, I generally remain hopeful, but I also, uh, I also have a little bit of worry that I carry with me closely. All right. Awesome. Well, Jim, this has been so fun. I, You've really inspired my thinking today too. And I'm sure all my listeners are also having you know, they might have a midlife crisis now thinking about how they, their relationship with data and how they've been doing it wrong. They need to do it better. Um, so I really appreciate you being here and hopefully you'll come back. I, I really want to actually dig more into some of your older books too. And I, there's just so much value there. So thank you for coming to chat with me. Oh, um, thanks for having me. And I'd be happy to be back on the show, Blake. Awesome, Jim. Well, hey, everybody, you have been listening to the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. <laughs>